Good morning. Are we live? Good morning. You can start, Janaina. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone watching us is well and safe. My name is Janaina Carvalho. I'm assistant professor. I'm assistant professor at Federal University of Minas Gerais, Brazil. And with great pleasure, I will moderate Professor Ushulonsk talk today, his talk entitled Focus Movement in the Low IP Area and Some of Its Consequences, is part of the series Abralinha ao Vivo. This series aims to provide access to contemporary debates in linguistics by inviting researchers with substantial contributions to the field to discuss their, their work. Our guest today, Professor Shulonsky, is a professor at the Department of Linguistics at the University of Geneva. His main area of interest is syntactic theory and comparative syntax. He has studied various aspects of the syntax of Semitic language, particularly of modern Hebrew, including clause structure, new subjects, the form and syntax of nominal expressions, relative clauses, and resumptive pronouns. He has also worked on Romance language and Romance dialectology and has written on topics such as criticization, WH movement and restructuring. More recently, he has become interested in WH in situ phenomena and is currently involved in a research project on French WH in situ. Among his many publications, I highlight Clause Structure and Word Order in Hebrew and Arabic, an essay in comparative Semitic syntax published, published in 1997, and Beyond Functional Sequence, edited by Shalonsk and published in 2015. Before we start, I want to remind our viewers that the questions can be written on the chat during the whole talk, either in Portuguese or English, and I will pass them to Professor Shulonsky in the question period after the talk. Professor Shulonsky would like to thank you for having accepted our invitation, and the microphone is yours. Hello, thank you. Uh, I can't see myself, but I imagine I'm somewhere there. Uh, can everybody, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? It's working fine, thank you. It's working fine. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. I mean, for those of you who are in Europe, good morning for those of you who are in North America or in America, I should say. Um, let me uh, share the screen so I can um, go through uh, the talk in some detail. Um, here we go. Okay, can everybody, can you see my screen now? Yes? Is my screen visible? Yes, it's yes, working. It okay, uh, now, so the talk is entitled uh, Focus Movement in the Low IP Area and Some of Its Consequences. And uh, the, uh, the idea of a dedicated focus phrase uh, was originally proposed, uh, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, in uh, Julia Horvath's dissertation, later published as a book in 1976, uh, to account initially for focalization in Hungarian. Uh, in work with Adriana Belletti, uh, sometime later, we developed an analysis of uh, post-verbal subjects in Hebrew and in Italian that hinged on this process of uh, focus movement in the uh, low VP area. Uh, uh, Daya Ragige's 1999 LI paper uh, argued in favor of a, a VP peripheral focus phrase as part of an analysis of inversion in uh, Kirundi. We'll come back to that a little later. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Jaya Silan from 91 arguing extensively in favor of a VP periphery uh, modeled on uh, Rizzi's 97 left periphery, which was composed of a focus phrase, a topic phrase, and so forth. Uh, this idea was independently developed uh, 
by, uh, by Adriana Belletti in a series of papers from the early 2000s and uh, gained, the idea gained wide recognition, I think, uh, to a large degree, thanks to this, uh, to her work, uh, which studied principally romance inversion. So I think it's fair to say that at this point, uh, um, the idea is mainstream. And in today's talk, I'd like to explore some consequences of this idea, uh, some of which are relevant for the theory of locality by studying uh, a number of uh, focus related but otherwise different empirical domains and try to see how far one can go in, uh, in unifying them analytically. Uh, a significant part of this presentation is based on recently published and ongoing work with Luigi Rizzi, who I'd like to thank, but obviously everything that I say here today is my entire responsibility. Now I'll discuss uh, four domains, four empirical domains. Uh, the first is uh, concerns inverse copular sentences. The second one uh, I'd like to discuss is the focalizing B constructions in Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, I'll talk about inversion in Bantu and finish uh, time permitting with a short discussion of uh, ellipsis, in particular of pseudo gapping uh, in English. All of these are related in a way that I'll try to make clear as the talk uh, proceeds. Okay, so let me start with, uh, with focus movement uh, in inverse uh, copular constructions. Uh, if you look at uh, the sentences in one, uh, they illustrate uh, direct, what we call direct and, and inverse copular sentences. Uh, and uh, the alternation that you see in one between John is my best friend and my best friend is John uh, raises some important uh, theoretical issues that we can discuss. Uh, one salient property, and this is the starting point, I think, of, uh, of my interest here, uh, is uh, uh, there's something on the chat here. Yeah, okay, sorry, ignore this. Uh, one salient property of the, these inverse copular sentences uh, across languages, so examples like 1b, is that the post-copular uh, nominal is always focal, uh, whereas in direct copular sentences like 1a, uh, focus can uh, occur on either the pre- or the post-copular uh, dp. And this is a fairly, uh, quite a well-known observation, and uh, the following examples uh, which are transposed to Hebrew from examples discussed by, by Caroline Haycock in a number of papers, and I'm citing one of them here, uh, should make this point clear. Uh, so in, a, in, in an exchange between A and B, uh, the examples are in Hebrew, but uh, so if one asks, uh, you know, something like, uh, who was the culprit, Miaya Poshea? Was it Danny or was it Bill? One can answer either Danny was the culprit with focus on Danny, uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you ask a question like 4B, uh, you get an exchange, tell me something about Danny. Was he the culprit or the victim? And here you can always answer, he was the victim or he was the culprit. So uh, the fact that in a direct construction, these uh, uh, 3B and uh, 4B illustrate the direct copular sets. The focus can, can, can fall on either the pre or the post copular noun phrase. If you look at the inverse sentence, who was the culprit, Danny or Bill, and you answer, the culprit was Bill. Here we have the inverse sentence. Stress, focal stress falls on the post copular DP. But six shows that it cannot fall on the pre copular one. So tell me something about Danny. Was he the culprit or was he the victim? And you, can only, you cannot answer that by saying the culprit was Danny. This is true in English. This is true in Hebrew. This is true in just about every language I've. I've looked at. And so this a kind of asymmetry uh, raises the question of why the copular 
why the post-copular uh, element here must be focal. This is the question that we should ask, I think. Now, one fairly standard assumption is that uh, both direct and inverse copular sentences uh, are derived from a single source, uh, which more closely corresponding to the, uh, to the direct construction. So this is a fairly standard uh, view. You start out with something resembling a, a small clause, John, my best friend, and then you merge B, uh, is, and then one raises the surface subject uh, um, out, uh, over out of it, and one gets John is my best friend. And to, to derive the inverse sentence, uh, it's the post copular, or the, sorry, the second DP, let's say the predicative one, that gets fronted into subject position. And you get my best friend is John. Now, 8a is not problematic at all, but the, eight, uh, the derivation uh, sketched in 8b raises the problem of locality because uh, John would intervene between the source and the target of movement. The problem arises both if one assumes a predicative small clause or a bare xp. Uh, for concreteness, let's take, let's take the uh, pred p approach or the pred p representation uh, as in originally, I think, discussed in Bauer's work and other work in, in the 90s. Um, then then Dick had developed this in, in a slightly different way in some work uh, that's cited here as well. Uh, so we have something like nine, where extraction or movement of my best friend over John leads ri gives rise to a uh, locality violation because John intervenes in the path of movement between the source and the target. So how can this locality violation be overcome? And this is, a, uh, this is, this is the question. Uh, the suggestion made in uh, the work that's cited here is, consists of several steps that let me go through that. Uh, what we suggested uh, is the following, that uh, starting out with A, so A is simply the, the bare predicate phrase with John as its subject, my best friend is the complement of pred. Uh, a focus head is merged. John is then moved to the uh, uh, subject of the, uh, sorry, to the is merged with foc, moved to the specifier of focus, if you like. Uh, then a, in an operation that, can be called smuggling after Chris Collins's work, takes the complement of focus, namely the pred p itself, which has had been which has been emptied of its subject by prior focalization in C, and moves it above to some position. And this step basically overcomes the locality violation. Uh, Later step B is inserted, and then it moves to T, and uh, we have the final movement moving the uh, subject, uh, moving the uh, the post copular DP, namely uh, moving my sorry the second DP, my best friend, the predicative one to subject position, and we end up with my best friend is John. Now, in order for this to work, of course, movement of the uh, uh, movement of my best friend over John uh, cannot consider John as a potential intervener. And uh, this, I think, um, can be dealt with by adopting a particular interpretation or view of relativized minimality uh, due to a, a paper by uh, Krapova and Cinque from 208, which is that only full chains and not single links in chains count as interveners for relativized minimality. So what this means is that if you look at, uh, let's say step three here, at the point at which my best friend is raised to subject position, the potential intervener, John, is only a link in a chain. 
the chain is actually formed between John here and John in the speck of focus. But my best friend will not, movement of my best friend does not cross over the whole chain. It only crosses over this link. So this allows it to escape the locality violation that it would not be able to escape if it moved directly from the post predicate position to the subject position as in as here. So I hope that this, uh, this view of um, this analysis is, is clear. This is what we developed in the cited papers. And uh, the, the, the claim that uh, John in here in particular, uh, the post copular nominal in the inverse sentence is in focus, uh, explains facts that were originally, I think, discussed by, uh, by Andrea Moro, uh, according to which the post copular DP is not movable by WH movement. So if you compare 12A and 12B, which photo of the wall do you think was the cause of the riot? This is the direct copular sentence where quale foto del muro corresponds to the subject, simply the surface subject of, uh, of this copular construction. This is fine, but 12B, quale foto del muro pensi che la causa della rivolta fu? So where extraction is where quality photo del muro here corresponds not to the uh, pre-copular DP, but to the post-copular one in the inverse structure. And this is ungrammatical. Same, is, uh, same can be re replicated in other languages. If you take 13 uh, in Hebrew, Ron was the mayor, uh, and you can say the, the mayor was Ron, but uh, the questions are asymmetric here. They asked me, or one asked me, who, who Ron was, it's fine, but they asked me who the mayor was, is not grammatical. And the explanation for this is uh, in terms of criterial freezing. So the idea is that the, uh, the uh, nominal that is in spec of, of the low focus position uh, is frozen, in a sense discussed by Rizzi in, in numerous works, and uh, therefore cannot move beyond the position where it, where it sits, then we specify or focus. Criterial freezing operates in various other places in the grammar, and it's not a specific principle operative here. But you can, uh, one can deal with uh, the facts in 12 and 13 and related facts in other languages and other constructions in terms of criterial freezing, which indirectly supports the idea that we're talking about. I mean, this is exactly what one expects if the post copular DP is in the inverse construction, is in focus, is focalized. And by focalized, I mean here, moved to the specifier of FOC. Otherwise, the system doesn't, doesn't give, give the right results. So a crucial component of this analysis is the uh, claim that focalization here is syntactic it involves movement followed by a step of, uh, of movement of the, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> uh, of uh, the smug smuggling movement that we discussed that I'll discuss a bit, a bit later as well. There's some problems with English. I'll put them aside now. Now, at this point, I think that there are three questions that come up which are, should be answered. Uh, the first, uh, so, one should wonder, one I think wonders, why the syntactic process giving rise, uh, responsible for moving the subject of DP uh, out of pred P takes the form of focus movement and not some other kind of movement. And uh, another set of questions concern the motivation for the smuggling step. Uh, why does it occur? What is its uh, motivation? What is, it, what is its uh, landing site? Uh, these are perhaps technical details, but they are extremely important to understanding the, uh, the operation uh, of smuggling in this context. And the proposal that we'd like, I'd like to make that answers these three questions is uh, by unifying it in a way is that the uh, 
I'd like to suggest that the focus phrase in the low uh, position is not freely available, but is systematically selected by a higher head. Uh, and um, this, um, this higher head is also involved in the triggering of the smuggling step, while other potential positions like topics or low subject positions and so forth are not selected in a similar way. So the idea here is um, somehow schematized under 16 on the document on the handout. That is to say, the focus, the focus head here is selected by this V or V selects focus, the focus, so it selects the focus phrase. And the same V has the property of attracting the complement of focus, which here would be pred P to its specifier. And this is a property, this, this is the, the select, this selectional problem, property that focus is selected here by this particular V is the source of, is the reason for why uh, the syntactic process uh, that is involved in deriving inverse copular constructions takes the form of focalization and not something else. And why, um, and, the, and it provides also a, at least the first step in an explanation of where and how smuggling is executed in the uh, grammar. Uh, languages uh, uh, employ uh, various computational devices uh, to circumvent violations of locality. Uh, uh, so the focus selecting verb in the low zone of the IP triggers specifically such a, such a device. Uh, the focus position, which is crucially involved in this analysis, is the low focus position in the immediate periphery of, uh, of the verb phrase, or more generally of the predicate. Uh, this low focus position um, licenses smuggling of the remnant of the predicative structure. This is most clearly indicated in cases in which the pre-focus structure contains the verb plus some other element, as in uh, the examples in 17. So in 17a, uh, it's not simply the verb that precedes the, uh, the subject, it's the verb plus some article. And in 17b, it includes a low adverb, like well, uh, in 17C, it includes the, uh, the quantifier all. And an example from 17D uh, taken from Spanish because Italian, these things are not, a, not as free in Italian as they are in Spanish, uh, where the whole VP, namely the verb plus the object precede the subject. And uh, I think these can all should, all, should all, should all be understood, excuse me, by, Considering the, uh, by having Maria, let's say in 17D, uh, moved to a focus position, to the low focus position that we discussed in the context of the inverse copular sentence, followed by movement of the VP remnant, excluding the subject to a higher position. And specifically, I would argue that this takes the form illustrated in 16. So the focus phrase here is selected by this V, and this V here also attracts the VP, let's suppose the big VP, uh, to its uh, specifier. Uh, now in Romance languages, this low focal position does not normally co-occur with an overt functional verb. Uh, doesn't, uh, this V here doesn't uh, show up in most cases. But there is, I think, striking evidence in favor of a systematic presence of this V head, which uh, coming from uh, uh, varieties of Spanish and Portuguese, uh, which manifest uh, a cleft-like construction, which is sometimes referred to as the focalizing ser construction. And some uh, references are given here. There are other references. It's, this is not uh, uh, exhaustive, hardly exhaustive, illustrated by the examples in, uh, for example, in 18. Uh, 
uh, taken from work by uh, uh, Mendes Vallejo. Uh, so if you take 18A, a question posed by uh, the speaker A, que trajo Laura? Uh, the answer that can be given, at least in these varieties of Spanish, would be Laura trajo eh, fue sangria, where the verb be here uh, occurring in the preterite form of uh, ser uh, uh, introduces or makes the focus uh, available uh, in the interpretation of 18b uh, is as given in the translation here, something that can be translated as a cleft, it was sangria that Laura brought. Uh, the analysis that I would propose here on the basis of what we have just discussed would be something like in 19. Uh, starting out with a verb phrase, a small verb phrase, uh, subject, uh, Laura trajo, uh, trajo uh, uh, sangria, uh, you merge the focus head and move sangria to its specifier. Uh, smuggling movement, uh, v, v is then introduced, R, R V, the same V that we had earlier, except that this V here has a, is phonetically realized as the verb ser, and this V attracts the remnant VP to its specifier. Uh, this is followed by extraction of the subject Laura and movement to the subject position giving rise to the structure that you see, or to the sentence that you see in 18b, in 18, in b's answer to 18. Now there are examples that show clearly that smuggling is necessary and not just V movement or, but me, movement of the verb plus some other material. So uh, take a look at uh, 20a and 20a, b and so forth. So here we have, uh, Andava siempre, which is the uh, material preceding uh, focalizing ser. And this is not a verb, it's a verb plus an adverb, plus a low adverb. Uh, here we have even more, me da miedo es la, es, es la arena. Uh, in this example from Portuguese, uh, this example from Portuguese, I think, makes the same point. Uh, A says something like, John gave an iPad to his older sister. And B responds with a correction, no, John gave, was a Kindle to his younger sister. Now, this data, I should say, the, the C is contested. I mean, I don't know if it's contested in Portuguese, but the similar examples in, uh, in uh, Spanish have been contested, whether they're actually grammatical or not. I think, let's assume they are, at least in some versions of in some varieties of Spanish and Portuguese. And I think what this shows us clearly is that uh, uh, what we have here is uh, focalization of uh, this whole thing and movement of the uh, of the uh, <coughs> remnant of the remnant uh, uh, verb v VP minus the two objects to the specifier of uh, little v. So again, it's the VP. This contains the traces of a Kindle for his younger sister which have been focalized, perhaps by moving the verb first inside the verb phrase to a higher verb position so that the two, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the direct and indirect objects are both stranded below and then focalizing that verbal constituent. I think that's the right way to look at it. Uh, the example in, uh, in D uh, makes the same point for Spanish again. The, the, the data is contested. So Gustavo le traía, era un regalo a la mamá. So here are the two arguments probably forming a, a lower VP out of which the verb has raised to the small, ver, the small V and then that VP is focalized 
and then the rest is is so what precedes era is not just the verb traia it's traia with the whole the trace of the big vp uh, you also get these impassives as an example in 21 uh, taken from uh, some some torpora in Verkauteren's uh, thesis uh, and the example i think in 22 uh, is interesting because it shows that uh, this b this ser is not the same ser that you find in copular sentences because both can co they can co-occur so here we have mi hermano estaba era triste so you have both B, this is the copular B, and this is the, in red here, the special V that uh, arguably selects the focus phrase and attracts the complement to its specifier. Uh, now, the V that selects uh, the lower focus phrase and spelled, uh, spelled out, so this V that spelled out as, as ser in, uh, Spanish and in some Spanish and some Portuguese uh, is null in Italian. Uh, so focal subjects which uh, remain final in Italian uh, um, are not preceded by any kind of overtly pronounced verb, but presumably a sentence like a risolto il problema Gianni contains an occurrence of this little v, an unpronounced little v that is pronounced in these varieties of Spanish and Italian and Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, this kind of parametric variation or this kind of variation in the phonetic realization of functional elements is extremely common, as you know, even across closely related grammars. It is, for example, uh, observed in the form of the uh, focus selecting B in clefts. So if you look at clefts in romance, you see that uh, the, uh, the copular B in clefts is pronounced in Italian, it's pronounced in European Portuguese, but apparently not so in Brazilian Portuguese. This is at least what the cited literature says. So, uh, this is uh, not unfair. The, the 23 then would simply be a case of non pronunciability of this B that is pronounced elsewhere. Uh, in our discussion, in my discussion of inverse copular constructions, uh, sentences earlier, uh, I noted the fact that uh, uh, the inextractability of the, focal, uh, the focalized uh, DP. So if we go back to these examples by, by Andrea Moro and examples, similar examples in Hebrew here uh, that show that the uh, post-copular DP in the inverse sentence cannot be extracted. This was due to criterion freezing. Uh, the same pattern emerges in the focalizing ser construction as uh, Camacho has shown. Uh, if you, uh, let's look at the examples in question. So, uh, Camacho discussed examples like 25 A and B, que se comieron los pájaros, what did the birds eat? But uh, when you add the B here and becomes que se comieron los, los pájaros fue, this becomes completely ungrammatical. And uh, he develops a different explanation for this. For me, this would be a simple, uh, this would simply be the same phenomena that we saw earlier, namely the element that sits here uh, well, I'm, which I'm after fue in the spec of focus, so the low focus phrase is frozen and cannot be further moved. Similarly, in 26, que era lo que Juan leía? This was a kind of cleft. What was it that Juan read? Uh, that's fine, showing that there is no problem in extracting uh, an object, uh, uh, of focalizing an object, but there is a problem when you try to WH move an already focal object. So que Juan leía era, ungrammatical. And a similar example is given in Portuguese in, uh, in, in Fercauteren's uh, thesis or book. Okay, so I think I've 
try to provide uh, two or try to discuss two empirical uh, areas in which uh, this particular kind of uh, focalizing uh, uh, configuration in the low area of the, uh, the clause uh, are, is manifested. Uh, the two domains are very different. I mean, there are two different constructions and you can think in terms of constructions, one doesn't get very far here because the constructions have not very much in common. But the uh, computational devices that languages use in the low focus area, uh, at least in these two cases, seem to be exactly the same, even though uh, the details vary, obviously. Um, and uh, I'd like so to now move on to a third domain. I'll discuss also in some greater detail some of the stuff is, I think, more well known than what I'll discuss now namely inversion in Bantu. Now, why inversion in Bantu? Inversion in Bantu is interesting because post-verbal focus is very common in Bantu. And there is a substantial literature arguing that it exploits precisely this low focus position. I mentioned some of, the, um, uh, some of this work in the introduction, but some other work is cited here. Uh, and uh, it's a debated point, obviously. Uh, there are students or specialists in Bantu who think uh, uh, otherwise. It's not the, the only view. But as I try to argue, I think it's the uh, um, one it stands to reason that it's the correct view, uh, in, if only because it uses Bantu inversion or Bantu focalization, low focalization, uses exactly the same devices that we looked at up till now. And a particular, uh, very striking case or example of Bantu inversion is what's called uh, subject-object inversion. This is a rather spectacular, at least to my ears, uh, configuration uh, that's illustrated in 28, uh, where we see that the, uh, uh, if you look at 28A, we have child with uh, uh, noun class one, uh, broke uh, the pot. So the verb here agrees with the child. The child broke the pot. And 28b, what you get is the pot broke the child. The verb agrees with pot. But the sentence means the same thing as 28a. Literally, what you get here is the pot broke the child but it actually means the child broke the pot. So it's as if subject and object have switched positions. The subject appears to the right of the verb, while the object appears uh, to the left of the verb, and the verb agrees with it in noun class. In this particular case, it's noun class seven. This SM means subject marker. So uh, agreement here works in have prefixes on the verb, which are, which have different forms depending on the noun class that they belong to. So this prefix here is the seventh uh, noun class, and this prefix here that goes on the verb is also the seventh class. Here it's one and one, so on and so forth. This is the seven again, this is the one again. Now an important clue to understanding this, in, this reversal, subject-object reversal, and various other inversion constructions in Bantu is that the post-verbal subject in 28b is interpreted as focus. And that's the starting point of the, uh, this, of the exploration that I'd like to pursue uh, of this right now. Uh, the observation that, uh, that the post-verbal subject in the inverse, in the in the subject uh, object in verge construction is focus is, is very common. You find it all over the, li the literature. And I won't provide citations here. Some are given in the bibliography that will at the end of the handout. Uh, but an, an important uh, um, a clue to the understanding of subject object inversion is, is precisely that. So let's, let's take a look at, uh, at 29. Perhaps I should say that uh, there is a morphological cue 
for a post-verbal or clause internal focus here that Bantu provides. I mean, we talked about uh, the Spanish and Portuguese ser. Uh, here we have something a little different. Uh, there is a prefix that the Bantuists call the disjoint, disjoint form. It takes the form of ra in uh, Kirundi. Uh, and when it occurs, the sentence does not have focus. This is why Nadia uh, Ragie calls it an anti-focus marker. The traditional term is actually disjoint marker, disjoint form. So if you had a disjoint form, this simply means children drank milk. The same sentence, exactly the same, if you take out the ra, if you take out the disjoint form, you get what's called the conjoint form. And this changes the interpretation. This means children drank milk. This is a contrastive or, or corrective uh, focus, but focus nonetheless. This does not mean simply children drank milk. It means children drank milk, not something else. Um, now, the point to keep in mind is that the, the ra cannot occur in, this, in the subject object reversal cases. So if you take the baseline sentence in 30a, uh, which illustrates the canonical SVO order with the disjoint prefix. Uh, so Chomsky wrote a book, right? And if you now, uh, if you do the, uh, the inversion uh, and you put the book in su subject position, let's say, uh, and you get the sentence 30b, this sentence means Chomsky wrote the book. And notice that there are two differences here. First, the order of the words. I mean, there's been a reversal, but crucially from a morphosyntactic point of view, this ra prefix is missing. So there seems to be a connection, at least in one direction, between focalization and the, the absence of the ra prefix in Kirundi, and more generally are the presence of the conjoint form in Bantu. Again, things are much more complex. I mean, the disjoint and conjoint do not only indicate focus, but let's let's stick to these examples for the for today's uh, talk. Okay. Uh, the analysis of post-verbal focus that I would like to suggest. Uh, crucially exploits the twin components that uh, we have seen at work in the inverse copula constructions and in the focalizing ser constru construction, namely movement of an element to spec of foc and raising of the complement of foc to its left, to a specifier of this V, if it's a, if it's a V head here as well. Uh, now, these two components operate in tandem because the head which selects the focus attracts the complement of focus to its specifier. So let's look at uh, how this works. If you look at uh, 31, uh, there is a word order difference here of some interest. So if, you, if, there's no, if there's no focus in the sentence, so that's where we get the disjoint form, the order in the verb phrase is wash cars well. So the adverb follows the object. This is the data that's given in the, the paper that I cite here. And cannot precede the object. However, when the object is focused here, so when we get no ra, then the order of the adverb and the object are reversed. So John washes well cars. This is what it takes to mean to say John washed cars well, not trucks. And the order object adverb is not grammatical. So clearly there is some movement going on here. I mean, that seems to be the best interpret the most immediate interpretation that we can give. Uh, the, uh, the adverb follows the noun. Here the adverb precedes the noun. Somebody has gone somewhere. Okay, so how can we uh, derive this? Let's see how we can do this. Well, 
let's assume that uh, in the case of no focus, so the case, the simple case of uh, John washed cars well, as in 31a, uh, the post-verbal position of the adverb is obtained by VP raising over the adverb, which I think as a, we discussed this earlier when this when talking about post-verbal subjects in Italian, but I think this is probably the way to look at post-verbal or close final adverbs in general. This is at least the view that Cinque and others have been promoting for several years. So in, even in languages like English, when you have a um, sentence, let's say the equivalent of Kirudi, John washes cars well, uh, washes cars, raises over an adverb which itself is merged somewhere on the left in the, uh, <clears throat> the hierarchy of uh, adverbial positions. Uh, so this is not particular to Kirudi, nor is it particular to non-focus. It's, a, it's a, an operation that, find, that one finds uh, in many languages. Um, and then after John Wash cars raises over the, the adverb, uh, then the subject moves out and the verb moves out and we get the sentence, we get this kind of representation. John washes cars well, uh, with well <clears throat> in the adverbial position, and uh, that's the right word order at any event. If we consider now the, the object focus case, in this case, how does this work? Here, we want to, what you derive is that the adverb precedes the object, or the object follows the noun. So how does this come about? Well, it's a little different here. It's a little different here. You, uh, the first thing one does after uh, confronting this structure is to merge the focus head and move the object to the specifier of focus. This gives rise to the, there, to the uh, representation cars, specifier of focus, uh, and well, John Wash with a trace of cars, with a copy of cars behind. So here there's no VP movement. There's no, this, not, this doesn't happen. Rather focus is merged, cars is moved to the specifier of focus, V is merged, ser is merged or something like it. And the remnant, the complement of focus, which is this moves to the specifier so that gives you well, John washed cars, John wash and cars is focus. And then again, the lexical verb wash and the subject move out to the, uh, to T or the ASP, it doesn't really matter where, and the subject itself raises to the EPP position of the subject, giving rise to the order, John washed well cars, where cars is somehow left behind because it's been focalized. Now, Nadia Ragije also notes that when the uh, that a focus can also occur on the adverb. You, so when you get cars well with the adverb following it, this isn't only a case of uh, non non focus. There could be focus on the adverb. And again, notice that there is no ra here. So John washed cars well, not badly. Well, this would again follow straightforwardly, I think, uh, starting out from this, you merge the focus. This time it's the adverb that's moved to the specifier of focus. And then the remnant, com the complement of focus is raised, uh, V lex at the subject raised, and we derive the, the order John wash cars well with well in focus. So it all seems to work. Um, this analysis doesn't require, um, it simply requires that we apply exactly the same uh, twin hypotheses that we showed were necessary or were, were, were at work in the case of the inverse copular construction and in the case of the focalizing cell construction, exactly the same thing. Um, now let's go to uh, subject focus. So subject focus, would work exactly the same way. And subject-object reversal would follow from the analysis in a pretty straightforward way, I think. So this is how it would work. I haven't gone through the whole derivation, a bit step by step, but you know, I can go through it in 36. So you start out with this, 
subject, verb, object. The subject, then you merge focus. You move the subject to its specifier. You move the remnant, which contains sub, uh, the trace of the subject, little v, big v, and the object to the specifier of the focus selecting v. And finally, the two movements involving verb movement could be short. I mean, a good reason to believe, I think, that in Bantu, the verb doesn't raise very high, but it raises a little bit. It raises out of this constituent, at least. And the subject moves to the subject position. So subject-object inversion would involve this kind of derivation. And again, we should ask two questions. How can the object move over the copy of the subject? And why is the subject uh, why is the subject here not a viable probe, target for probe by the subhead, the head that attracts the subject to its specifier, the EPP head? So why does the EPP head attract the object and not the subject? So two questions, how can the subject move and well, why does it, why is it attracted and how it's moved, I guess. One and two here should perhaps be reversed. The answer to the uh, question of uh, how it can move without violating relativized minimality was already given. It was given in the case of the, when we discussed the uh, inverse copular construction, the copy of the subject here is simply one link in a chain uh, which contains this element as well. And moving over a single link does not constitute a violation of relativized minimality. Hence, nothing prevents the object from moving the subject position. As for the second question, why is the subject not a viable target for probe by subj, by the EPP head in 37? Why does this head go for this and not for that, not for this? And I think the answer again lies with freezing, criteria, criteria freezing. If the subject would attract the sub, the subject here, the subject would have to move to the subject position, to the EPP position. Moving to the EPP position would violate relativized, would violate criteria freezing because it's in a criterial position here. And we know from independent evidence that the focalized post-verbal subject in Bantu cannot move anywhere. So an example in 39, uh, I think from, uh, again from Kirundi, shows that uh, relativization is not possible of person in this focalizing structure. We start out with those books, uh, <clears throat> those books uh, read person, meaning the person read those books, and you try to move person to some, to relativize it, the person who read those books, and the result is completely ungrammatical. Uh, the explanation would be that the uh, uh, umuntu here, the uh, post-verbal subject, focalized post-verbal subject is frozen in position. If it's frozen here, then it's also frozen here, which is why the subject could not be a legitimate target for probe by subj, and therefore subj, which in principle could take, could target either the object or the subject since both lie in its C command domain and neither C commands the other, uh, uh, would uh, ends up, um, can only attract the object because attracting the subject would violate uh, constraint on movement. All right, a question that comes to mind to any speaker of any language other than Bantu, or let's say speakers of Romance languages, is why does Romance lack this kind of object, subject object inversion? So, why do we have sentences like 40A, bought the books, fue, uh, compró los libros, fue Pedro, which involves post-verbal focalization in the way that I've described it, I hope. But we never get los libros compraron fue Pedro, which would be the 
Spanish equivalent of Kirundi subject object reversal. The object would be in subject position, the verb would agree with the object, and the subject would be in focus. And the interpretation of 40b would be uh, the books bought Pedro, meaning Pedro bought the books, excuse me. Uh, now, uh, subject, uh, where's the phone? Is not the hook. The, um, so one plausible place to look for an answer to the difference between romance and Bantu is in case theory. Uh, in romance and in English, uh, phi agreement uh, goes with case. And the general rule is that nominative case uh, goes with phi agreement on the, way, uh, on the main verb. So if you look at 41, uh, it's an example of locative inversion. And it's clearly the case that it's the uh, subject, <coughs> it's the nominative element that controls agreement. So down the hill rolls the ball. The ball is the nominative, down the hill, roll the balls when this is plural. And what controls the agreement is the nominative element. There is only one, and it controls the agreement. Bantu is significantly different from English in that in many Bantu languages, in a large number of Bantu languages, the uh, agreement in locative inversion is not controlled by the subject, by the nominative. It's controlled by the locative. So if you look at uh, an example from Dirk's, uh, Dirk's work, um, Digo, uh, here we have an example. From the river emerged seven fat cows. So we have 16 is the case, 16 is the noun class of, uh, of the locative river. Uh, in Bantu, locatives are nominal for all practical purposes, at least in this, you, in the locative inversion. Maybe they are also in English. But in Bantu, it's clearly the case that they are. And we see that the verb emerge agrees in noun class with the fronted, uh, with, a, with, a, with a, the locative, and not with seven cows, seven, seven fat cows, which is noun class 10. OK? Uh, so. It has been repeatedly claimed in the literature, in, in the Bantu literature, literature on Bantu, that uh, Bantu agreement is simply not contingent on case. And Baker made this point in 208. Uh, in a paper that I cite here uh, by uh, Dirks, Michael Dirks in 212, uh, takes even, an even more radical posture and argues that Bantu languages simply don't have uninterpretable case features in their feature inventories, they simply lack case. And that agreement is determined by purely uh, relational structural conditions and is not determined by nominative case at all. Uh, so um, the, this is apparently too strong uh, in uh, other work. Uh, it has been shown that maybe this is only true for nominative case. Anyway, uh, the, in 40B, in the Spanish example in 40B, los libros compraron fue Pedro, uh, the direct object checks um, accusative case. So it cannot be attracted to subj, to the, the EPP head, which presumably has a nominative feature. Moreover, Bantu agreement must be a, uh, no, I mean, that, that would be enough, I think, to say that, that this is simply the case system Case is intimately linked to agreement in that nominative goes with agreement. And once you have a non-nominative there, agreement simply cannot, cannot produce itself. So what goes on in, um, in, uh, in the inversion cases, in the subject-object reversal cases in Bantu, is that, is that agreement is possible because it's divorced from case. And it's simply uh, a question of which is the nominal that sits in the, in the, in the spec of subject. Uh, the EPP is the element, the element sitting in the subject position is the element that controls agreement. 
this seems to be the rule or almost the rule in much of Bantu. Uh, now, if from this perspective, uh, inverse copular constructions raise the issue of case in agreement because it doesn't always work the same way. If you look at Italian again, and Italian here represents, I think, much of romance, if not all of romance to the exclusion of French, uh, the uh, agreement goes with the most, the rule about Italian basically, Spanish and so on, is that agreement goes with the, uh, <clears throat> the most, um, referential DP, okay? Not with the structural subject. So here we have the photos on the wall are the cause of the riot. The cause of the riot are the photos of the wall. This will of course not be possible in English. This would be, this would be is in English, but in Italian, it's always sono. Now in, uh, in work with Luigi Rizzi, uh, we argued that uh, the case checking and agreement system and the EPP head are distinct. And we, have, we suggested that there were two distinct positions, one we call subject one and the other subject two. And uh, if you look at 44, you can see how we expect to derive uh, 43. So, once after we have after the pred p has been fronted to the specifier of the special focus selecting little v, sub one the case agreement head is merged. Uh, the uh, now again it can target both dps. It can either target the cause of the riot or the photos of the wall uh, in terms of agreement. Uh, but it must agree with the photos of the wall, not with the DP print. So this is exactly the opposite of what we see in the subject object reversal in Bantu, where in this configuration, uh, but I don't know if it's subject, whatever the head here is, uh, actually targets this NP and not this NP for agreement and movement. Uh, the, uh, in Italian, sub one targets the photos of the wall and not the cause of the riot. Now, why is this so? Uh, uh, you know, you can consider, I think the idea is that in principle, sub one can, can target both. And as if we compare subject object reversal and, and uh, inverted copular constructions in Italian, we see that indeed both possibilities are, are, are available. But uh, uh, the, um, Consider the idea that uh, that if sub targeted the predicative now, if it targeted this one, then this one would not be case licensed. So sub one must target the photos of the wall uh, in order to case license it, and one might think that the case of the cause of the riot is not assigned through subj, but actually through pred. It's a very local case that's assigned through pred. Uh, many languages have a special case within copular constructions in, you find this in, in uh, instrumental in Slavic, etc. And it sometimes shows a nominative and so on. And you, one can assume that pred can license, can case license this DP internal to the pred P. So this gets case license from pred and sub one licenses the photos of the wall to case. Uh, and then at some point sub two, the EPP head is merged and the head, this is the head responsible for the subject criterion for the EPP, basically uh, capturing the obligatoriness of subjects. Uh, and um, here, uh, this DP cannot be attracted because it's sitting in a freezing position. Only this DP is. So uh, as a result, this yields the inverse sentence with agreement necessarily going downwards 
uh, from the left uh, to the right in Italian type languages. Now, much more needs to be said about agreement. I won't, you know, th there's a lot of things that can be said here. I won't discuss this anymore in this talk and I don't think I have time to do it. What's the time now? It's almost an hour. Okay, I'll go on for another five minutes. Is that okay? To finish up or? No answer, so I think that's okay. <laughs> so I'll go on for another. Okay, minute. okay. Okay, I'd like to uh, finish up by uh, discussing, uh, mentioning another empirical domain that uh, has not been, that could be interesting to pursue uh, work on. Uh, and that concerns a completely different area, uh, the area of uh, ellipsis in particular, the, the area of pseudogapping. Uh, and pseudogapping is an ellipsis mechanism that uh, elides part of a VP uh, stranding what's called a remnant. The remnant is uh, underlined here in the sentences in 47. So Kathy wants to study astronomy, but she does not meteorology. I didn't expect John to like it, but I did you. The DA will prove John Jones guilty and the assist will Smith and so on and so forth. Uh, it's also clear from the literature that the remnant, namely this element here that's uh, underlined, is always interpreted in contrast to the parallel expression in the antecedent clause. Because if it, were, if it weren't, then 48 would be grammatical. So you could say something like, he drinks whiskey more often than she does whiskey. But that, does, that sentence is terrible because whiskey here has to be contrasted with something in the antecedent and it simply is the same, so it can't be contrasted with it. So in a sense, this can be uh, the post, uh, the, the, the remnant in pseudo-gapping can be thought of as uh, involving um, focalization, which is precisely what, uh, Jayasilan proposed in 201. In fact, uh, it was Lasnik who initiated what came to be known as the movement plus ellipsis analysis. And Jayasilan uh, proposed that the underlying remnant in pseudogapping is, is moved to a low VP edge spec focus P, and then the rest of the inner VP undergoes deletion. This was his analysis. Uh, and this approach has been developed and implemented in many different ways by various authors and captures the observation that the alighted material is a constituent uh, with holes in it, as to say, as in 48, 49B, uh, which is the answer to A. So something like, gee, I've never seen you on campus before. Yeah, neither have I you. So the idea would be that you here is moved out of the VP, and then what remains is the, is a continuous, continuous constituent at least, which is seen on campus before, and it's that that gets deleted. The similarly in forty nine B, an example from uh, uh, Johnson's work. Uh, now we could stop there and simply adopt this, but it seems to me that the smuggling step that proposed earlier for the other phenomena might also be at work here. At least this is extremely suggestive. If uh, uh, there's an suggestive similarity between the pseudo gappy examples in 50, uh, I gave a dime to Mary, but I did a nickel to Sue, or she's working today and he is tomorrow, are resemble very much examples from the uh, ser focalization structure that we saw earlier that I've repeated in 51 A and B or given in 51 A and B. So 51 B is basically like 50 A. And 50 B is basically like 51 B. And that I think is a, uh, um, suggests that we could analyze pseudo-gapping in exactly the same way. You move the remnant to speck of focus, you merge, uh, you merge uh, uh, a V that selects focus and you then you move the remnant, uh, not the remnant, the, the, the containing VP or VP to the specifier of V and then you delete it. Now, if this analysis of pseudo-gapping is on the right track, it, it provides further support for the idea that all ellipses 
involves a prior movement step of the uh, to be a lighted constituent. And then VP ellipsis would then be not VP typicalization, as, as let's say uh, Johnson suggested, followed by deletion, but perhaps focalization maybe of the subject of something else, followed by VP movement to the specifier of the head that selects focus. Uh, this head uh, uh, <clears throat> may be actually much lower than we think. I, mean, I don't have time to develop this, but this would be a, a direction for research that I think should be interesting to follow. Um, so let me conclude. No, there's no conclusion, so let me read the conclusion. So I tried to show that constructions that seem to have very little in common, namely uh, inverse copular sentences, B focalization, subject object inversion and pseudo gapping, exploit a computational operation that involves focus movement and smuggling in the sense of Collins uh, 205. The idea that low focus is selected by a frequently phonetically unexpressed head and also attracts the complement of focus raises the question of why left peripheral focus and cleft focus do not seem to go in tandem with phrasal movement above them. Now, one possibility worth considering, I think, is that the focus selecting head that we discussed is a V, and the category that merges with it is also presumably a V. Hence, the step of merge yields a labelable configuration. The complement of left peripheral focus of the uh, uh, or the focus of, of the head clefts is not a V. It's some kind of clausal constituent, whatever that is. So that merging it with V would then raise perhaps a labeling problem. But of course, this needs to be pursued further. And I thank you for your attention. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I think, can you see me? Because I, I can't see anyone. Let me see in the chat. Um, so thank you for your talk. Very interesting dealing with several different phenomena. We have a couple of questions. Uh, Achilles Descarineto asks whether the example in 19, uh, whether we have inform inf informational focus in 19. It's an example from Spanish. It's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the question? I didn't understand the question. He's asking whether we have informational focus there. This, mm -hmm. this is the data point question, just a clarification uh, question. So in other words, uh, if we look at a sentence like 18, what did Laura bring? Laura brought was sangria. Is that uh, it, this example suggests that um, uh, it's an answer? It's a it's a it's a what's called the yeah, informational focus or 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 a, or a focus uh, answer to a WH question. So it simply is new information focus, if you like. But the uh, focus that's associated here can vary in interpretation. It's not always. Uh, in other examples that I gave, uh, it was clearly contrastive uh, or, uh, or you know, corrective. So I'm not uh, sure it's always one or the other that remains, that it can be valid. Does that answer okay. the question? I think yes. He has another question about the Kato and Miotos example. He, he doesn't provide a number, but it's an example from Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, which would translate as uh, no John gave gave you us a Kindle to the sister younger. This one. This Let one. me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. Uh, so he asks where the the chunk formed by the direct object and the indirect one is a sort of a compressive focus, isn't it? So he's asking whether the chunk formed by a kindle and to the sister younger form together a uh, contrastive focus. Yeah, I think uh, um, at least from what I mean, one should look at, uh, this is taken from the literature. I can't say more than what uh, Kato and Miyoto <laughs> say here. But uh, 
it seems, uh, in fact, I think I made a mistake here. Uh, the answer is not uh, he gave a Kindle to his younger sister, but the whole thing is focused. This whole thing should be focused. So it means, uh, no, he gave a Kindle to his younger sister, not an iPad to his older sister. Okay, okay, yeah. I think. Uh, and he, he further asks whether in this uh, sentence, this contrastive flavor should be associated with the left periphery. I not... think he means the left periphery of the sentence, like projections ah. um, above the P. I think that's it. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, the, the point I try to defend here is that uh, the focus, uh, the computation of focus that's exemplified by in these cases uh, involves the uh, the low focus area, not the left peripheral mm -hmm. one that's found mm -hmm. elsewhere in in Portuguese, in European, in Brazilian Portuguese, in Italian, and various other languages. Uh, contrary to some of this uh, published analyses, there are other alternatives. This is specific analysis, so I don't think it it really depends on the uh, has anything to do with the uh, left peripheral focus, which is not selected okay. in B in any way. Okay, and there's a further comment by him, which uh, is associated with, with that that we were discussing. He says, should we expect a further raising of the focus to the specifier of FOC in the left periphery, followed by remnant movement to the top in the, the sequence? So again, about this, this sentence, should we expect that um, part of the sentence would move to focus? In the no. left periphery of the sentence and the, the rest to top of it. I don't think so. I think that if we do that, which this was a proposal that was made in the literature at the time, specific proposal that's been made, but then you lose the generalization. Uh, you lose a few of the generalizations. You lose the uh, relationship with the all the other phenomena I discussed, which would hardly uh, qualify for uh, left peripheral focus. Um, there's no evidence that they involve left peripheral focus. If you look at the uh, inverse copular constructions, or if you look at the, the Bantu inversion, it's clearly not, it doesn't involve uh, the periphery. It involves the very low area of the, uh, of, the, of the sentence. So I don't think that this focalization that we see here is, uh, involves the left periphery and does not involve uh, movement of focus and then topicalization of the rest. Uh, I'm not even sure why it would be topicalized. I mean, uh, notice that the movement of the uh, the attraction of the uh, complement of focus to V is not necessarily a case of topicalization. It's it, it's scrambling move. Uh, it's some kind of uh, it, uh, not scrambling. I mean, it's it's a it's the kind of movement that uh, uh, the interpretation of which is not obviously topical. I mean, one could think of the low focus position and the, 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 the role of V in attracting this to the specifier as, I mean, an idea that might come to mind is that this is, a, uh, this involves splitting the, the sentence uh, in, into the focus and the, let's say, Presupposition, and that the the movement of the complement of focus to the specifier of V uh, creates uh, what uh, what you know, might be called uh, you know, creates the uh, provides the syntactic basis for a particular interpretation of focus where the focus is actually separated or. Uh, split from the, uh, the rest of the sentence, as has been proposed in some of the literature on focus by Krivka in particular. So, but I didn't want to develop this because that required that it's, it's a whole different thing. Okay, so now we have a question by Renato Lacerda. He, he starts the question actually contextualizing what you said. So you said that the presence, the presence of the focus phrase and the consequent movement of the complement of the focus 
uh, is dependent on the presence of the head that selects focus. Okay. But what determines the presence of this head, meaning why and when is it selected by the higher head? And what head selects the head that selects focus P? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a <clears throat> if, uh, if selection works stepwise so that every head selects a lower head and this is the way it works, then one would have to explain why this head is there and uh, why it's not always there because it's clearly not always there. When there's no focus, it's probably not there. If we look at the, uh, uh, <coughs> at the, uh, uh, the word order, let's say, that we get in, in Bantu, we see that there are differences in, in, in the morphology of the verb and the morphosyntax with these two forms that have to do with uh, the presence or absence of, uh, of, of low focus. So um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, I don't know. I don't know how, uh, what actually selects it. And uh, um, you know, that, I think that question needs to be thought of. OK. Uh, Simone Gesser also has a question. So um, he talks about sentence like, o que a Maria comprou, which would translate as what Mary bought, literally. Uh, and we have two options to answer such question. We can say either foi um livro, was a book, or actually, sorry, uh, foi dois livros, was two books, or foram, two, foram dois livros, were two books. So what Mary bought, was two books, were two books. So she asks whether um, your approach could um, give an account for that in terms of focus and agreement? Well, I don't know about the focus. I'm not sure that the interpretation is different. Uh, that that uh, the question, this has also been noted in, in some varieties of Spanish, uh, that uh, the agreement of the, uh, at least in the focalizing ser construction, the, uh, the verb can sometimes uh, be plural or sometimes be singular. And there seems to be some instability there. Um, I'm not sure what this is. Uh, what this comes from. I think that uh, one should think about it in exactly the same, in the same terms that one thinks about the uh, the, the instability, if you like, of agreement in copular constructions, in the specificational or inverse copular constructions. So languages like Italian are pretty strict, and languages like English are pretty strict in that uh, agreement goes in one direction and not in both. Whereas in, uh, in many languages, it seems to depend on all sorts of factors, some of which have been uh, discussed in literature that I cite, uh, and some of which in some languages, for example, in, for me in Hebrew, there are cases where it's simply, it's simply difficult to determine. I mean, both are kind of possible. So I'm not sure how to think about this in Spanish or in Portuguese, if we're talking about focalizing ser. Uh, uh, there may be more than one option for the uh, subhead to look down and to agree with, and there may be a speakers, you know, there, there may be more than one option. That would be my answer without okay. answer to direction. Okay, I think I have a question as well, because we don't have questions anymore in the chat, as far as I can see. So I, I'm familiar with your work with Roy about, say, a popular sentence in French. And I was wondering, um, so I know there, there is uh, the, the, the story that you talk about um, copular sentence carries over to some extent to, to these copular sentences in which you have a focus projection and, and then the, the B head can't agree with uh, the DPs and DC, the, the C actually enters as a as an element that B can agree agrees with. But I was wondering how the two DPs, or at least one DP, gets case in these constructions, since it appears that the, the probe is, is agreeing with C and not with the two DPs that we have in the sentence. Uh, so maybe we should give an example for the, for the audience. Uh, yeah. Because it's hard. I mean, it's not something I talked about today. So um, 
Um, I, I guess you're referring to cases where you have uh, uh, my best friend, say John, or you have yeah. the sir mm -hmm. pronoun, and then you have the, the verb agree, the, the copula agreeing with the with sir and not with the uh, not with anything else, basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> well, what we uh, in, in the paper that you cite, um, we related that to the uh, the fact that in that in, in uh, French was actually Italian-like, in that it probed downwards, but it couldn't. Uh, but unlike Italian, which allows agreement to apply without the agreement target actually moving to the position of the agreement head. So Italian doesn't require movement. You can agree with a post-verbal subject in Italian without having to move it, because the Italian perhaps allows expletives of uh, various sorts. French doesn't. So the French S comes in as, in a, as a kind of solution to that problem. So French is actually Italian-like in the directionality of agreement, but it's uh, lacking the uh, uh, means that uh, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese have of uh, licensing and uh, leaving the subject lower down, leaving an NP lower down, and not moving it for agreement. It introduces the S as a kind of expedite. It's not exactly a nominal expedite. I've been mean, doing some discussion. That that would be my answer. Uh, but it remains. I mean, there's more work, I think, to be done in relating it to the things I talked about today, because if there's more structure there, the question is where all this stuff is going. And I didn't talk about French today, so. Okay. So I think we still have another question by Renato Lacerda. Uh, he says, the remnant movement of the complement of the focus is resorted to in order to derive the fact that focus appear in the last position. Alternative non-cartographic cartographic analysis resort to PF constraints. For example, focus final due to the nuclear stress rule or information structure constraints given before and new uh, without focus movement. So my question is how do interface constraints such as those fare with the motivation of the movement resorted to in the cartographic analysis? Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very relevant question because uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find my way here a little bit uh, in the handout. Uh, yeah, um, there have been uh, not only specific attempts to account for even let's say uh, let's take the case of Bantu uh, low focus uh, in terms of prosodic alignment of some sort, so the elements move around in order to in order to uh, so that so that the main the main uh, uh, pitch accent or the main accent falls on the final element in the uh, in a prosodic unit that that's relevant there let's say the phonological phonological phrase or whatever it is uh, there are various technical issues and data issues and empirical questions I won't go into. That I think require a lot more thinking. But on a more principled basis, uh, my question is the following: why do we why would grammar resort to two parallel computational systems, one of them in the prosody and one of them in the syntax, if a single computational system can derive the right word order and the right uh, the right interpretation, the right in, the right output? without anything else. So it seems to be much more economical. And perhaps I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the right way to look at it is to say that there is a single computational system, not two or three. And this single computational system derives uh, by various mechanisms like the uh, uh, the smuggling movement that we discussed, which was not proposed for focus, it was proposed by by uh, Collins to account for a, for a, basically locality problems in the derivation of passive and raising and similar constructions. Uh, but these mechanisms uh, derive the finality of focus 
without resorting to any non-extra grammatical principles. That seems to me a priori desirable, not undesirable. It is exactly what we want, is a computational system that is more impoverished. Once we have a two computational systems, one that the syntax does, and then the prosody comes in and does things and undoes and moves things around and so on, uh, I wonder how, whether this is a good candidate for how grammar actually works. So I, th I, mean, I thank you for the question, but I, my position would be uh, until proven otherwise, uh, there is a single computational system. Okay, so let me see here. Yeah, I think we are done with questions. Yeah. So I think that's it. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank you. I want to thank you again for for thank the you. very interesting right. talk. Thank you. And, and the uh, debate after that. And uh, I will now leave you and say goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.